This morning, the full title is God's Design for Marriage and Family. And I, I was going back and forth with kind of, what kind of title to put to, to this message. But I, uh, I want to emphasize God's design for, for marriage. As we see in uh, the scripture, uh, namely, so we see it uh, established in the book of Genesis. I want to read from Genesis 1, 24 to 31. <clears throat> and uh, this is foundational. Verse 24. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to, their, to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And behold, rather, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this account of Scripture that brings us back to the beginning of the earth, of when you created it. And we thank you, Lord, that this is rooted in history. Uh, Lord, that this is not fictitious, but it is historical. It is actual. And Lord, we have much to learn from it. And Lord, we pray that as we look into this matter of marriage and what is your purpose for each and every person on the face of the earth, Father, we pray that you would help us to become more... Uh, uh, to become more deeply in, in, uh, established, Lord, in these truths, so that we can be uh, of help, Lord, in our generation that has gone astray. We pray, Holy Father, that you would help us in these things. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Today is one of the most uh, important sermons I think I will ever preach. Uh, there's so much that can be said on this topic uh, it's, an ex it's an extensive topic, and uh, uh, of course, I can only s share what um, uh, I can do <laughs> in the four, 40 minutes or so, or 45 minutes. And, um, and basically, this sermon is given in response to our Canadian government's ungodly new law, which criminali criminalizes anyone who may try to help to counsel a person who is struggling with same-sex attractions or who may be seeking advice on how to leave the homosexual lifestyle and then wishing to live according to God's design for their lives. Basically, according to this law, churches, pastors, the average Christian, counselors, marriage counselors, uh, and also parents they could be guilty under this law of, of helping their children to see what is God's design for them. Eligible believers and churches that seek to honor Christ will, will respond and ought to respond to this with the truth of God, with God's holy word. How do we respond to this? With God's holy word, which is the truth. Because what the government has done is essentially an attack against God directly. Because 
If we go back to, and we'll look at this verse uh, shortly, in Genesis 3, verse 1, the devil came to Adam and Eve and says, has God really said? Did God say this? Did God really say that? So what is happening? This is an attack against God directly, questioning the authority of Scripture, questioning the authority of the church, and it's an attack against God. It's an attack against Christ directly. We see in Scripture Christ is a uh, he's the groom and we are the bride we see this and it's very important to establish that um, and so it's an attack against christ directly which tries to blur or destroy that that uh, relationship we also see it's an attack against the gospel directly because it's a denial that god can do uh, anything in the life of a person it's a denial that god can help can actually help a person come to faith and be transformed. They deny that. It is an attack against the Church of Christ directly, basically saying that uh, you churches, you're not teaching the truth. This is the new truth, and you have no authority. It's an attack against Christians directly, all Christians, and all humans, and all humanity collectively, because basically saying that if you have an expression of homosexual lifestyle, you will remain that. You can't go back the other way. And some may think that to express what the Bible says and to point out sin in a person's life, they'll say, even what I'm doing here this morning, they'll say, that's not very loving. That's not very loving for you to do that. How do we respond to that? Well, let me say this, quite the opposite is true. It is one of the most loving things I can do. Mm. It is one of the most loving things I can do uh, in my life as a Christian. Because to share the gospel and to share God's design for all of humanity is one of the most loving things to do. Mm. To bring people back to God. Mm. It's an expression for, of great love for God. First of all, I love God first and foremost. The greatest of all commandments says that we are to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And what the world is trying to say in this is that, no, 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 you, you, you've got to show love for man first. You can't, you can't go and, and, and say these things. You'll hurt people. Well, <laughs> people have to be hurt to realize that they are living in sin. And so it's great love for God and for Christ. Again, our world says, no, no, you must, you must first of all love man. No, <laughs> we're called upon to love God first. Amen. And... This, they'll say that, um, um, again, this is a great expression for love. Uh, uh, for to love God is to also love his word. If we say that I love God, then I love his word. I love everything about his word. I love the whole counsel of God's word. So to love God is to love everything that he says. His commands, his precepts, his, com his ordinances. And to stand on it. It's also a great love great love of mankind, sharing what is best for everyone, knowing that a loving relationship between one man and one woman is God's design. That's how God designed it, designed to protect family, uh, families uh, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, in other words, if I, if I were to see, if I were to go in my backyard and uh, enjoying a lemonade on, on the porch, um, on our deck, and then I look, look over and I see my neighbor's house on fire. Do I take my cell phone and say, what an opportunity, I'm going to film this, I'm going to put it on YouTube, it's going to go viral, I'm going to make a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> what do I do? No, I drop everything, I run over and I help, I, uh, I, I try the best I can to, to bring the people out of the house. And so that's what we ought to do. When we see people, their lives are being destroyed by the different things. It's also a great love for all believers. I love all of God's people. I love all of those who are in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And it is for that reason I also stand firm on this truth here this morning. So the big question is, what has the government done? What is the question? What is the issue here? What has the government done? Well, here's a short summary uh, from a letter. <coughs> written to Pastor John MacArthur a few weeks ago. Uh, Bill C-4 
will criminalize, among other things, causing another person to undergo conversion therapy, promoting or advertising conversion therapy, unquote. In the preamble of the bill, it says that the belief that, quote, heterosexuality, cisgender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. That's in the law. They say that that is a myth. It's a myth. That's the word they put there. According to Canadian law, as of January 8, last week, the belief in God's design for marriage and sexuality will now be seen as a myth. The bill defines conversion therapy as a practice, here's the quote, as a practice, treatment, or service designed to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual, change a person's gender identity to cisgender, change a person's gender expression to that, so that it conforms to the sex assigned to the person at birth, repress or reduce non-heterosexual attraction or sexual behavior, repress a person's non-cisgender gender identity, or repress a, or reduce a person's gender expression that does not conform to the sex assigned to the person at birth. So there's a lot of uh, words there. <laughs> what does it mean? It basically means if we were to approach someone, God created you as a as you're, you're born a boy, you're a boy. You're born a girl, you're a girl. Amen. And so, bottom line, if you try to tell an adult that, no, 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 listen, you, <laughs> don't be confused about your gender, you are a boy, you're a man, biologically, and no surgery can ever change that. <laughs> um, and so, now, that's criminalized. If you are to try and lead people to come and to know Christ, to have a better understanding about their sexuality, now it's a crime. It's a crime. So since March of 2020, this is going back here for two, two years, March of 2020, when a pandemic was invented and declared, the government quickly stepped in to control the masses in a much deeper way by putting forth a false narrative, whereby revealing that it has a, the authority over the medical field. The government already had authority over the medical field, but now it has even greater authority over the medical field. So what, what, what we're seeing right now, basically the medical field saying, you must get the vaccine, otherwise you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't buy groceries. There's uh, apparently a uh, rumor that Costco is considering that, that if you don't get the vaccine, you can't go in. So that's something to, to, for us to think about. The government also wants to have authority uh, over the families, saying, no, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. We'll tell you what to do, what you, what you can teach your children. Uh, you know, and now uh, apparently uh, children can, uh, at school, they can get the vaccine on their own without the parents even knowing about it. That's, that's terrible. <clears throat> Uh, the government wants control over your own body. If a, if a person wants to get the vaccine, that's completely up to them. But the government is saying, no, 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 you have to, uh, you, you, you have to get the vaccine, otherwise you can't do this, you can't do that, you'll lose your job. And basically, if you are agreeing to that, basically you're handing over the autonomy of your body over to the government. So again, if a person wants to get the vaccine, it's completely up to them. It's completely their choice, their decision. But the government is wanting, wants to take that away from them. We see how the government has uh, exercised authority over independent businesses. How many hundreds of thousands of businesses have closed since two years ago? Mm. They're, they're, people have lost everything. They've lost their livelihood. They've lost everything because of government involvement. And also the education system. The government wants to control, already has control of a great portion of the education system. They want more. They want to control what is being taught in the schools and so forth. And also, uh, over all churches. The government wants control over all the churches. Mm -hmm. And we know that right now, uh, a, a large percentage of churches, the government already has control over them, but it is not their right. The, the churches they're, they're, they have their own sphere of sovereignty, and we looked at this already before. Now, in light of all of this, and of all people, peoples and believers and churches, 
they have the God-given right and authority to speak out in opposition and in particular to instruct, to remind the government that they are God's servants for good, as we see in Romans 13, if and when they are in fact doing good. But when they are not doing good, those who are the gatekeepers of truth, and who are they who are the gatekeepers of the truth? The church. Those who, we, we alone have the truth. We know what the Word of God says, and we have the truth. And so what are we going to do? Is keep it to ourselves? No, we have to remind even our governments, hey, this is where you are going in error. And so um, we're called upon to speak out, sometimes boldly, which is seen in the history of the church over and over again. It's one of the very interesting topic is that we look at the history of the church, we see time and time again where the church stood up and stood in opposition to tyranny. I'll share a quote with you in a minute. Because if the church of the living God remains silent, there is no one else out there who is the bearer of divine truth. There's no one else out there. There's nobody else. John Knox. He's the uh, founder of the churches in uh, Scotland back in the 1500s. And, uh, and he encountered problems with the government there. And this is his quote. He says, resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. John Knox, let me say it again. Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. He also says, true it is, or it is true, God has commanded kings to be obeyed. Acknowledging, yes, Romans 13. But likewise, it is true that in things which they, which they commit, the government, they commit against glory, that is God, God has commanded no obedience. There are many other quotes that we find uh, regarding John Knox in, in light of these things. It reminds me of the passage in Matthew 5, 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? There's a wound, it hurts, right? And salt also disinfects. So Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be those who have a certain measure of sting to, in our generation. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. If the church has ceased to be uh, salty, then the world walks all over it. The, wor the world is walking all over the church. So here's a reminder for ourselves in regard to how we are to respond to tyranny, even now with the government overreach since 2000. 2020, we see that this also applies to us right now in, re in regards to Bill C-4. We are not, we saw this already before, when I preached on Romans 13 back in September of last year, we are not to obey the government, we are not to obey the government or conform to their rules when, three rules here, when the government forbids what God, what God commands. Mm -hmm. We are not to obey when the government forbids what God commands. In other words, the government forbids now all Canadian citizens from teaching that God has ordained it, that the only pleasing and acceptable relationship in the sight of God is the union of one man and one woman in marriage, which include, excludes all else. They're saying that, no, you can't teach that, teach that anymore. You're going to be criminalized. Well, <laughs> we basically at that point, we, we choose not to obey the government when the government forbids what God commands. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when the government commands what God forbids. That is, the government says, accept the new definition of marriage, as in back in 2004, and, uh, and now we will now give special privileges to those who practice homosexuality. They have special protection and rights. And uh, for example, and I thought of this, you know, if a church, if a church, <clears throat> Uh, you know, there was someone in the church who was guilty of adultery. Okay? What's the church, church supposed to do? The church is supposed to discipline that member or that person in the church. That's what we're supposed to do. And homosexuality is a form of adultery. And so, now, what are we supposed to do? The, the government is directly involved, in directly saying that you can't do that anymore. It's not their right. It's not their right. And so homosexuality falls under the category of adultery because, again, it is an expression of adultery. 
So we are, the government does that, and we are to, to not obey the government when the government commands what God, what God forbids. And thirdly, when the government commands what it is not theirs to command. In other words, it's not their authority to redefine marriage or to affirm sexual relationships one or another. It's not their authority to do that. So let's turn to the Word of God. What does the Word of God, what does the Word of God have to say? Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, 26. <clears throat> So let's break it down. It says here, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Our image here, our implies the plurality of the Godhead. And uh, the God is not, not just one, but he is three persons. After our likeness, and it says here, And let them, that is man, he's referring to man here, uh, let them, so he's not speaking of one individual here when he's using that term. I'll get into that in a minute. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created, created man. And that word here in the Hebrew is the word uh, Adam. Where we get the word Adam. And Adam being means human being. That's all it means. Human being or mankind. Let us create, let us make mankind, he says, in our image. Let us create a human being in our image. And it says here, it says here, in his own image, and of all the creatures on the face of the earth, only man and women, they have the image of God in them. In the image of God, he created him, again here is singular, speaking of mankind, and he says here, Male and female, he created them. So mankind consists of male and female. So man is described as being both uh, male gender and female gender, not an endless variety of gender identities. Just two. Two genders. Biologically, two genders. Verse 28. And God blessed them. Um, that is male and female, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, what does he say? It was very good. Very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So thus, very clearly and basically, it's simple to understand that this is God's design for humanity. There is one humanity consisting in two genders only, male and female, and the two complement each other. They were designed for each other to meet each other's needs on every level, emotionally, physically, uh, sexually, and in procreation, that they may fill the earth. It's only possible with one man, one woman, to to, to, uh, uh, to fill the earth with other human beings. There are, no, there are no other earthly relationships that can be fulfilled like this. None. And when a man or woman uh, live out their lives in the gender that was given to them at conception, at birth, they are honoring God with their lives, acknowledging that God is over them. That's part of God's design. Let's go to Genesis 2. Continue on, on the narrative of Adam and Eve. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Um, now out of the ground... Uh, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called every living creature, that, that was its name. So it was always the intention of God to create a helper or someone to be equal to Adam. And so here at the beginning, there was only him and he was naming all the animals. He was seeing that the, here's a giraffe, male and female. Here's an elephant, male and female. 
and what about me? So there was so it was always the intention of God to create a helper, uh, and uh, here here's what it says. The man gave names to all the livestock and, and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but to, for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. <clears throat> and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought it to, to the man. And the man said, this, is, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So the Hebrew here, the word is, for man is ish, and for the woman is isha, because she came out of man. Verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall... Uh, turn the page over, shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Moving on to chapter 3, verse 1. not responding too well. sure why it's not working too well. Now we get into the account where they were tempted. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had, uh, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? So here, immediately we see the devil presenting a question, putting doubt in their hearts. The question was brought to Adam and Eve to cause them to doubt God's word and authority, his, uh, and to question God's creation order. And this is at the root of Bill C4. This is at the root of Bill C4. Basically, does God really say that his creation mandate calls for the union of one man and one woman in marriage only? Oh, oh no, we know that, we know better uh, here is our new and improved version of morality. And by the way, all of that stuff on what the Bible has to say, it's all a myth. It's all a myth. That's what's going on. In our post-modern society, we're also a post-Christian society, <clears throat> moral absolutes don't exist. Moral objective truths or absolutes, they don't e exist because people are guided by what? Their feelings, their emotions, and their experiences. These are things that validate truth to them. Basically, anything goes. You know the, the, the slogan for Nike? You know what it is? Just do it. And that's what the slogan is. Basically, it's a, it's a reflection of our culture, isn't it? Just do it. Anything goes. Or the sky is the limit. And you know what? When we have, when we have a culture that is that way, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. But we affirm that there is one true God from whom flow moral, objective, and absolute truths. And to deny that, that is a very dangerous course of action for any culture, for any society. Well, after the fall of Adam and Eve, what happened? Did things improve? Were things getting better and better? No, we see quite the contrary, don't we? We see a rapid moral decline for all of humanity. We see the first murder, Cain killed his own brother. He murdered his brother Abel. And one of those specific areas of decline is sexuality. We see that in Genesis, where uh, we see where God brought forth a great flood because the sin, wickedness of man had reached a point where God said enough is enough. And also we see the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, one of the great sins there was uh, perversions and, and homosexuality. And that's why God destroyed these cities. We see also when, uh, just before Israel entered into the land of Canaan, God established all sorts of laws and gave them to the people of Israel. One of the Ten Commandments says that you shall not commit adultery. And um, speaking of the, the preservation and purity of marriage, we also see in Leviticus chapter 20 where God was warning them not to be like the nations uh, that, uh, that are in uh, those who are in the land of Canaan. Don't be like them. Don't practice what they're doing. And he's saying here, verse 13, if a man lies with, 
a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Mm -hmm. And back to the Old Testament, uh, they, uh, they were oftentimes put to death for, for this. Mm -hmm. This is not something that's practiced today, but this is something that was practiced on occasion in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So now let's, let's go to Romans chapter 1. And I know I'm throwing a lot of verses at you here this morning. This is not working too well. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Romans 1, 18 and following. And Paul makes it very clear here the following. So for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. There's no such thing as a true atheist. An atheist is someone who is deliberately and intentionally suppressing a truth he already knows. He knows that God created him, but he's suppressing that truth. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. <clears throat> and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for the lie, for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For they, their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up uh, natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. For uh, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, they God, uh, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of un unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God, they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but also give approval to those who practice them. And let's turn to Romans 2, verse 14 and 15. So I'll give a commentary here. For when Gentiles, that is all non-Jews, he says here, who do not have the law. In other words, they, the, all Gentiles, they don't have the scriptures in front of them. They don't have the Ten Commandments in front of them. They don't have the written law in front of them. And so, But he says here, nevertheless, by nature, do what the law requires. What is that saying? It means that they, nevertheless, have an understanding of the basic laws of God, the moral laws of God. It says here, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law, the laws of God, is written on their hearts with their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So what's going on here? What this is saying is that in part is that there is a written moral law or code in all human beings put there by God as part of his creation order, laws which affirm morality. This comes uh, as a result of us being created in God's image. <clears throat> in all cultures, murder is wrong. Do we see in nations in the world where they say, oh, murder, that's not a law in our country. You can kill anybody you want. <laughs> Everybody knows it's wrong. Everybody knows that murder is wrong. What about stealing? Stealing something. If you go to a store, walk into a store, and you take something that doesn't belong to you, is the law going to say, oh, well, just go ahead. <laughs> it's a free-for-all. You can do whatever you want. What about lying? Everybody knows lying is wrong. You know, in, in all cultures, everybody knows that lying is wrong. What about dishonoring your parents? 
and uh, I'm thankful for the Asian culture, especially in the Philippines. There, it's very firmly established, honoring your father and mother, honoring your grandparents, and honoring anybody who's older than you, even your brother or sister, is that it's, it's firmly established in the culture there in the Philippines. And, I, and it's, it's wonderful to see that. Canada, we've lost a lot of that mm -hmm. in our country. We've lost so much of that. Um, what about uh, adultery? Is it right in, in, all, in certain countries of the world? No, everybody knows these, these, these are wrong. Why? It's because it's part of the moral uh, code or laws that God has put in everyone, and these are part of the Ten Commandments. So it's not by accident. So this is what uh, Romans 2, 14 and 15 speaks about. They are a law to themselves. The work of the, they, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Everybody has these laws embedded in them. And so you can go to any culture of the world. Everyone knows that fornication is wrong, that adultery is wrong, pedophilia is wrong, that homosexuality is wrong. They know. Even without knowing the scriptures, they know it's wrong. It's because it's hardwired in all of us uh, it's an unwritten code or laws from God whereby all have a general sense of right and wrong on these things. It's because, again, we're created in the image of God, which is why one does not need to have the Bible in hand to know that all sexual practices outside of marriage, of the marriage covenant between one man and one woman, is wrong. It is wrong. It is sinful. And if a person chooses not to listen to his conscience and chooses to go against God's commands on sexuality, he or she is heading toward self-destruction. Every time. Every time. But our culture is under the delusion that man is evolving. Uh, back in 2004, I remember when Paul Martin was the, either he was already the prime minister, but he was uh, advocating for same-sex marriages. I remember that. Uh, and he was saying that, that man is evolving. We're evolving. We, we, we're, this is good. This is a good thing. Uh, and I remember him saying that. Well, is there hope? I can go on and on here this morning, but I think you understand what's going on. Is there hope for those who have become enslaved to sinful practices which are an offense to God and not pleasing to Him? Is there hope? Well, absolutely. Hmm. And you know I was going to say that. <laughs> absolutely there's hope. And so we establish, we stand firm on what God says regarding human sexuality, that God's design is for one man and one woman in a covenant union and a relationship together. That's what is God's design. That is the healthiest. That is the where uh, both are protected. The children are protected. That is what is God's design. It's not by accident. It's for a purpose. And so I think of the uh, passage in Matthew 19, 25, and 26. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? 26. But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All things are possible. God can change. He can transform uh, people who have been trapped in all forms of sexual deviations. While our government thinks that it can close that door, that no one can move back toward heterosexuality, and say that's not possible, you can't do that, you can't go there, the reality is that their view is a myth. Their view is a myth. They say the position that Christians hold to is a myth. Their view is a myth. I have met so many people, and I know of many people who have who once were living a life of homosexuality and have come to faith in Christ, have abandoned it and have come to faith in Christ and now have a, a spouse and have children together. I have met many, uh, and I know of many. So, on the one hand, the government says this, but counseling and teaching and directing and inviting people to move in the direction of homosexuality, that's perfectly fine. There's no crime against that. So this law is clearly one-sided. It's unjust. They haven't thought it through. They haven't thought it through. It's because they have debased minds. 
But now it's a crime to stand for the biblical position of God's design for marriage and for men and women. It's a crime. How absurd is that? So our country and government is walking on very thin ice. And God takes these things very personally, and we will, and will, God will not hold them guiltless. They will give an account, and they will suffer the consequences of this. But again, there is great hope for all who are trapped in any sexual practices that are displeasing in the sight of God, and it's called the gospel. The gospel is good news. So I knew you uh, knew I would get to this passage, or you were thinking about this passage. Here we are, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and uh, to verse 11. And Paul says, You do not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. We can include their fornicators, adulterers, etc., etc. And Paul says, And such were some of you. In Corinth, the city of Corinth, but you were washed, he says. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So we see here the transformative power of God in saving people's lives and transforming their hearts. <clears throat> he says, but you were washed, you were washed, you were sanctified. It makes me think of the passage in Titus 3.5. He saved us not because of works, done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of God, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, who transforms a sinner, who saves us, he washes us, he cleanses us. It doesn't matter what your past was, it doesn't matter what sins you've committed in the past, God forgives when you come to Christ upon repentance. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That there is a Savior who does wash and who does cleanse. And uh, I rejoice that in the history of the world, you know, how many people who once lived a life of homosexuality and have come to faith in knowing the one true God, and they've, they've, it's behind them because God forgives them. God washes and cleanses them. So therefore, regarding this mass message of the gospel, that we will proclaim regardless of what the government says. In this context, we are to continue to obey the Lord regarding the gospel and continue to stand on the whole counsel of God and His Word. God has the power to transform the worst of sinners. He has that power. I mean, I look at myself, look at all of you who have come to faith in Christ. He has that power to transform you, and He does. It is a true transformative work, and uh, we rejoice in that power. For even when we were... Uh, uh, and when we feel we may feel so unworthy to come to the cross of Christ, He calls on us to come as we are. Come as you are, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. So I want to close with two verses, uh, and Paul says the following: "The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent." Amen. It's a command for all of humanity to come to faith, regardless 